So um, I don't know what your first world problems are, but my first world problems usually revolves around food or the lack of thereof. I go to my fridge, no one's home, and there's nothing to eat. Well, not literally. There's a lot of things to eat. I mean, there's chicken, unopened chicken, there's pork chops, there's all types of things. Then, then I'm going to have to cook it, right? And my wife's not home. And so I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm frustrated. And I'm like, there's no food. What am I going to eat? So I cook the pork chops, and I don't like it, and I taste it, and I'm a terrible cook, folks. So like, I don't like it. I try to make a sandwich, I don't like that. You know, my, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm a sinner, stop judging me, jerked. Uh, I mean, usually the greatest um, rumblings in my life takes in front of buffets. And you go, what? You know, there, how could there be... A problem when there's so much food. Well, sometimes I think, how could all this food suck? You know, how could the soda be flat? How could the roast beef be overcooked? And how could the mac and cheese taste so cheesy? Yeah, I mean, like, and one time at a buffet, I got into a huge fight with a person where my wife had to get. Be- in between me and a guy. He had a knife. <laughs> but that's another story. Both Harvard and Princeton neurological scientists, cognitive neural scientists, have said that first world problems are created by a conflict of too many good choices. <laughs> Did you hear that right? The conflict is created by the options of too many good choices. Which means first world problems are not real problems in real world situations around the world. They're just, what, exaggerated, hyperbolic situations. Let me tell you right now, in the, in the, in the first world, homeless people have first world problems. You're like, how? They're bums on the street. I feel so bad for them and despising them at the same time, you know? And and so one time I was doing a ministry where we were serving the homeless and brought sandwiches. We made peanut butter jelly. We were on a budget, you know? And and, and, um, I I went to this man, I said, do you, you know, do you need some food? Are you hungry on the subway? And he's like, who are you? Like, you know, I'm a pastor. We're here as a church trying to serve people. You want to talk to me about Jesus? I'm like, I'm like, yes. But let me give you some food. He gets the food. It's peanut butter and jelly. He goes, this is peanut butter and jelly. And then he says, do you have ham and cheese? (laughs) If you want to talk to me about Jesus, give me ham and cheese. I mean, only in a first world do you have a homeless person that's not hungry. Or a homeless person that has a choice. Or wants choices. Now, if you want to compare a first world homeless person in New York City to your problems and my problems... You don't have it worse than him. So if he has options, how many options do you have? I mean, it's ridiculous. If you really thought about this, how does this affect the way Jesus wants to shape Christians or our faith? How does this affect our faith? You go, would it affect it at all? Well, of course. Jesus says very clearly in the New Testament, when much is given, what is it? Much is required. Or Stan Lee, one of the greatest cultural theologian writers of Marvel, says in Spider-Man, what? With great power comes great response. Everybody knows that. People don't know the Bible, but they know Marvel. (laughs) Oh, yeah, I know that one. The great, what? Much is given, much is, who said that? Stan Lee, oh, yeah. With great power comes great responsibility. I mean, so you take what Jesus says and what Stanley says, and you go, how does that affect Christians in the first world? Well, we have a huge problem because a lot of us in the first world, especially in the city, all talk about rights 
and privilege rather than responsibility. And so a lot of times we're so focused on these petty things, we lose focus on what God is trying to do in our city and in the world. So the question I want to answer today for all of us is how do we overcome this idiocy of first world problems? Let me give you one first world problem I found online. And um, it's a girl. And uh, read it with me. What does it say? Asked for a what? A whipped, no whipped cream on my tall, tall Starbucks order. It gave me a grande with extra whipped cream. And she started crying. So that's was, that was funny. But okay. <laughs> But that is a first world problem. And that's what we're tackling today is to understand that no matter how big our problems might seem, they're not real problems. The problem is with the what? The responsibility and the grace given to you growing up here in a first world. And it's, it almost becomes idiotic. And so let's turn to this text where... <coughs> Jesus experiences first world problem idiocy from his disciples. Everybody say amen. Thank God that God doesn't just use really perfect people. If you read this text and you follow anything Joe was reading, you're like, Ser really? Because if you come to this text, you know everybody knows you know, James and John. They were the first disciples of Jesus. Here, what you don't know is that they came here asking Jesus for this position of honor, not the first time. They already asked us in previous texts. They just asked Jesus, can we sit on your, can, when you, you know, come to your glory, can we sit on your right and left? Forget the other guys. The other, you know, ten guys, whatever. Forget. Make us over them. And because Jesus said, no, stop asking me, they got their mom. They got, so, so think about how, I mean, seriously, stupid James and John are. They can't take no for an answer, so they go to their mom. Grown men go to their mom and go, mom, Jesus said no. They, he said we can't be the most important. We're not going to be VIP. So, you see here in this story, you, you see James and John's mother coming to Jesus fuming and go, Jesus, I heard you said no to my boys. They're the greatest boys in the world, Jesus. And here, this is where the story continues. So the mother of Zebedee's sons came to Jesus with her sons and kneeling down, asked a favor of him. What is it you want? He asked. Jesus said, grant the one of these two sons of mine may sit at your right and the other at your left in your kingdom. And Jesus, I mean, how many people here, when someone asks you something stupid or idiotic, you roll your eyes? I roll my eyes almost every day. I'm not going to say to who, but I do. I mean, Jesus here must have been rolling his eyes. I mean... Who does this? He goes, Jesus says, you don't know what you're asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I'm going to drink? We can, they answered. When, they, when the ten heard about this, they were indignant with the two brothers. Now, when, when some annoying comes and asks for stupid things, people around you, and more than once, people get really annoyed. And this is, this is happening. I mean, these are people selected by God to change the world. How many people here want to change the world? How many people, you go, you know, the whole, this whole justice thing and sexual, you know, sexual slavery in the world, this justice mercy movement in the church. So many people want to be hipsters now. They want to get in with like serving the poor and poverty and, and everybody wants to be cool. But here, a lot of people don't understand here for James and John, the cost of being great at all. Right? They don't understand. So what do you learn here then? The first lesson I want you to catch from this text is this. How do you end this first world idiocy? Well, 
Watch. First, you got to what? Say it to someone else next to you. You really got to find something what? Now, come on, say it again. You really got to find something better to cry. cry about. Really? Are you serious? James and John are crying about that they're not going to be the greatest in the kingdom of God in heaven. Not that they don't go to heaven. They want to be the greatest in heaven. I mean, I've seen this in my life many times. One time I saw, uh, you know, I had a friend, a girl, she got a bad haircut. And it didn't look like she got a bad haircut. It looked like her life ended. <laughs> and some ladies are like, you don't know. You don't know what the hair. The Bible says, he goes, it is actually, it's biblical. The Bible says a woman's hair is her glory. Okay, I get that. <laughs> I understand. I have my first world problems, so do you. But, I mean, it, it was like, I mean, it, it was like really Sandy, 9-11, and her, I mean, natural disaster, a tsunami took place. And she was like dying. She's like, call 911, call the FBI, call FEMA. I mean, it, it was like her life ended. And I was just thinking, man, if people cried like that for their sins, the world would change. I mean, we have first world problems, so we start crying about these petty things that are not real problems, and we end up missing what we really need to cry about. Because we're so caught up in stupidity. We're so caught up in that that we lose out. So here, I have a question for all of us. And okay, don't be ashamed, okay? I have my issues that I'm ashamed about. First world problem, I mean, the food thing is stupid. I, I, understand, I understand that gluttony is a sin. But I like seven options. But so do you. Here in this text... God is trying to show us what is it in our life that we're crying about. That's just plain, really, if you really put it into perspective, it's freaking idiotic. It is stupid. I pray right now the Spirit of God will show you that. What is it? What are those things that we're crying about? Like James and John here. What is it? What does it look like? I pray the Spirit of God will show you. All right, let's, let's move down. So that's the first thing. We've got to really find something better to cry about. Second, check this out. This is what Jesus says to James and John, to teach them about what it really means to follow Jesus and be a Christian. Because when the, when the ten heard about this, they were indignant with the two brothers. I mean, even Judas was mad. And he's like bad. I mean, if Judas gets mad, that's really, you're in a you're, you know, bad direction in life. And, and Jesus called them together and said, You know the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. Their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whatever, instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be what? A, read that with me, must be a servant. And whoever wants to be the first among you must be a slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. You know the word leader that we use all the time? You go, leadership is from the Bible. The word leader does not exist in the Bible. Not in a Judeo-Christian framework of thinking. Leader is a corporate word. And usually leader defines, did you use leverage? If you use Jesus' language of leadership, he always uses the word servant. To give away power, to empower others. A lot of people miss this part about what it means to be a follower of Christ in a first world like this one, where we have everything. And you go, so Pastor Sam, what are you trying to say to us today? Look at my life and how much I have, and I should be grateful, and I should be like worshiping Jesus because of all the stuff I have in my life? Well, yes. So what do you want me to do? What is the application here? Do you want me to like give money to the poor, sponsor Child World Vision, watch the television commercials, and start giving my money away, and so I can feel better about myself? Is this about money again? <laughs> I mean, do you want me to give money to some cause? So, you know, are you going to get off my back then? No. 
What I'm saying is, you cannot change the world without first changing yourself. What I'm saying is it's impossible to be the hope of the world. We say that the local church is the hope of the world. It's impossible to be a hope when you're just a consumer. And sometimes we're a consumer not even by choice. We're a consumer because we live in an environment that glorifies mobility. So what I'm saying is that that's what Jesus is tackling. That's not what I'm tackling. That's what Jesus is tackling. Jesus is tackling the issue that's before us. I'm sweating here. Oh, Lord. First world problems, right? The AC is not. Why is the AC not blasting when I'm preaching? God, I'm doing your work. But here, that's what we're addressing, folks. Let me just tell you right now, I mean, one of our college students, he just got into this medical program where he's almost guaranteed to be a doctor unless he's really stupid in the end. I'm kidding, no. I mean, he's really going to end up being a doctor. Um, He's a real bright guy, but I met him in high school, and this kid is a complainer, the best complainer I ever met in my life. His name is Patrick. (laughs) And, I mean, what he talks about to me on the fast food line, when we go, he goes, I'm so poor, Pastor. My whole family's poor. I got a bad, bad, you know, thing in life. I don't know why I'm like this. I'm, I'm just thinking, from my perspective, I mean, I don't know what you're complaining about. You are bright, really bright. I, I mean, he's not here, that's why I'm saying all this. Is. And, um, you know, and, uh, you know, you have a bright future. You have potential that most people don't have. You have opportunities that most people don't have. You got a full scholarship to college. And then he was complaining about, oh, they're not going to give me enough money. How am I going to live? <laughs> I'm just like, first world problems. I mean, and he was a complainer and a complainer. He goes, I don't have enough. I don't know if I'm enough. I don't know when I'm going to have enough. That's gonna be, I'm going to have enough like 20 years past him, but I'm going to be working at the projects. Everything is deterministically negative. Everything, if I become a doctor, I'm not going to be a good doctor. It's just like he was complaining, complaining, until he went to Peru. He took a, and he got a scholarship to Peru. And he complained about that. (laughs) My wife was wrong. My wife was wrong. It's her fault. It's her fault. She told me Peru. Now, (laughs) and then, so... And he started complaining over and over again. I'm just like, I'm sick. I'm just like the peeps, peeps. <laughs> Pastor Bill, you need to handle this guy. He has no idea the opportunity he has. He has no idea that he's a leader. He didn't see himself as a leader. When he, when he went to Panama, I'm sorry. And, and he saw how the real world lives. And he thought that he's going to go help some poor kids. Mother Teresa says the poor does not empower the rich. The poor changes the rich. The, you need the poor to change you, to realize what you have in your life. What you have is actually luxury and not necessity. So when we start complaining about how we don't have this luxury and that freedom, it's idiotic. And what Pat saw there was how blessed he really was. And it changed him. He came back to New York, a new man. I get it, Pastor Sam. I get it. I get it now. I'm like, you sure? I get it. I'm going to be a leader. I've been given so much. I finally get Spider-Man. I don't know about the Bible, but I get Spider-Man. I mean, he, it changed him because he realized that his problems here were really not problems. They were just complaints. You see... If we want to change the world, as Jesus did, it has to begin with us. We have to begin to change. And that's what really Jesus is trying to show the disciples. And, I mean, thank God. Thank God. Like, God doesn't demand perfection from us. Amen? Right? He starts where we're at. I mean, these idiots in this, (laughs) James and John, like us, we're idiots. It's like... Really? Seriously? That's, that's, that's what you're crying about? And the greatest, you know, sociologists talked about this. The greatest problem with this generation is that they have nothing better to do except to watch Netflix. And then we complain about how, why all the episodes are not on. 
Why the next season's not here? Why can't, do it, why can't they do it faster? And it sounds really dumb. And that's what God is trying to engage in our lives at this point. To change us that way. So, how do we end first world problems? The idiocy of them? Well, second lesson we learn from this text is what? Say someone next to you, you really what? Got to find something what? Better to do. Seriously. I mean, if you're complaining and you love complaining, and let me tell you, our church people, they know how to complain really well. <laughs> we complain better than we worship. I mean, seriously, if we had a complaining marathon at 180, I mean, it would be full. I mean, if I had a box of a text for just complaints, it would be like 100 emails. I have a problem with this. I have a problem with that. And that's what Christianity's become in urban cities. Christianity's become what I don't like the, I don't like the worship. I don't like the ser- sermons too long, sermons too short. The sermon is not this. The, the worship is not this. The church is not this. So we become consumers. What if, just for a minute, we thought about what Jesus said and really started to focus on the real problem? The real problem is not out there. The real problem is where? You should say the next person to me. That's the real problem. If we fix that. No, no, the real problem, it's here. It's me. It's my preferences. It's my addiction to control. It's the fact that me, I want it this way. And if I want to be part of anything even small or big and part of God's plan and the spirit of God moving to change the world, then as Gandhi says, you got to what? First, see the change in yourself. You got to be the change you want to see in the world. So today, real practical application for us. What are you complaining about? And then, you know, look at yourself and slap yourself, silly, and be like, seriously? And ask God, God, what can I do rather than be upset that my meat is overcooked. You know, <laughs> we were coming to church the other week, and my wife gave me a sandwich, an egg sandwich. I'm a sinner, okay? <laughs> Don't judge me, jerks. Now, I mean, and I like my egg runny. You know, the yolk spills out. <laughs> my son always goes, that's disgusting, Daddy. Why do you want to drink that? I'm like, you know, yeah, and, and um, you know, it's like, and when, and she, when she overcooks it, and I'm eating, she's feeding me in the car, I'm driving, I got first world problems, right, my wife is feeding me in the car, I'm like, this is overcooked, <laughs> my wife rolls her eye, like her, her, eye, her eyes are huge, stigmatism, just unregularly, like, huge, and it costs a lot of money, glasses, and then, you know, and um, I mean, her eyes roll back, to the other side of her head inside the crane. I mean, it, it like, you know, and, and, you know, I've realized that I have my preferences too. And so do you. And this is not about, you know, being mature or anything like that. This is really just about our environment and how it shapes us and how it molds us to freely complain about these little things that really are stupid. And I'm praying that the Spirit of God changes me, and I pray that the, you pray that the Spirit of God changes you so that we can really tackle real problems and join Jesus and actually change the world. But we have to start with changing us. So don't look at others. Don't look at the world. Look at what? Yourself. Will you stand with me? Will you lift your hands to the Lord? Now, Holy Spirit, I want to pray you would come now and help us very practically today
practically. Help us examine ourself and first why we need Jesus and why he died for us on the cross. And rather complaining about our lives and our first world problems. Let the first world problems and the attitudes of that, when things don't go our way, I pray, God, that it would remind us really how blessed we are. That that's our problem. And I pray, God, that you would flip that around and remind us how much you've given us so that we can actually become grateful and change and realize that you've given us a position of power and leverage, no matter how little it seems compared to the elite in our world. We have to embrace this. And I want everyone, I want you to lift your hands to God as you pray this. And I want, I want the Spirit of God to remind you of this. If you are going to college, and if you have graduated college, and if you actually have a master's degree, you are the 1% in the world. You're like, really? Yes. Statistically, you are the 1%. You go, but I want to make 31,000 a year. I'm so poor. I could only go watch one movie a week, not two. Most of the world lives on $40 a day. I mean, $40 a year. You've been given a privilege in this city by God. God's chosen you. He's caught you and have blessed you. Until we begin to see that, we'll never have enough. It doesn't matter how much. Because we're always going to compare ourselves to Bill Gates and Oprah. You're always going to feel sad if you do that. All right? He has a $500 million yacht, okay? That's not going to happen. But if you compare yourself to the rest of the world, normal people, where normal lives are lived, you've been given an amazing privilege. We've been given this amazing gift by God, chosen by God, to be a blessing. But that's not going to happen if all we talk about is how we should be great and we should be number one and how we should be served and not to serve others. That's not who Jesus is. That's not what Christianity is. So today I pray the Holy Spirit conviction on you that we will find a new cry, a better cry, and we would find the work of the Spirit, the work of Jesus. Find it, hear the call, and do it right now. Let's make this our prayer. Let's cry out to the Lord and say, Hosanna, God save us. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. 
come before you this afternoon the real secret here of joy is really gratefulness folks I know social media and media and culture itself begins to shape a narrative that says that you are not enough and what you have is not enough and you need to get enough and you need to get more. The gospel is countercultural to that lie and opens our eyes. So Holy Spirit, open our eyes to the blessings in our lives now. Yes, gratefulness is the only thing that could really defeat FOMO. Gratefulness is the only thing that will defeat our first world problems and help us start, allow God to change us so that we can be the change we want to see in the world. Folks, if we can become that, as Jesus says, the church can be the hope of the world. Will you bow your heads for the benediction? May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. And all God's people say, amen. God bless you. We'll see you at the park next week. <laughs>